we call him Kung Ninendao. I, I guess I could start with how I was brought up and stuff. When we were kids, we used to um, spend a lot of time with my grandparents, and we learned how to garden, cut wood, chop wood. And it was uh, it was a good life. You we learned how to work hard every day and things like that. But along alongside those days, you uh, you learn the value of uh, the value of working hard, which is something a lot of our people value as somebody that's hard working and and things like that. Uh, Years ago, that was a uh, that was a big thing of uh, families were getting together. Those are some of the main things they wanted to know of one another is uh, whether or not your grandsons or your nephews or your nieces were hardworking people. So that was a that was a big thing back in the day. Uh, the other thing that I remember well from back then was. Uh, the uh, camaraderie that all our people used to have. There's always that same story that never escapes me. Is, uh, my grandma and I were walking to Wiki one day to go get some groceries, and uh, there, was a, there was a guy on the other side of the road, and my grandma stopped him, and he says, uh, are you cold? And that guy says, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling cold. And my grandma said to him, well, Tyne's not home right now. But if you wanted to stop by the house and stoke up the fire and have something to eat, there's homemade bread on the table, there's fruit there, and, uh, and uh, there's wood in the closet. You can warm up and and uh, sleep if you want to. Uh, we'll be back up in a little while. We're just walking to the store and coming back. And I just thought, uh, <laughs> I just thought to myself, like. Uh, you know, sometimes I think about that now. If 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 you were to do that now, to tell people something like that, you might come home to a to a house that's been totally ransacked. There's no TV. <laughs> there's no nothing, right? So, but I mean, when we got home, the guy had actually cooked a supper. He had made us supper, and left the supper at the uh, kitchen table. And, and, you know, he put a uh, the. Uh, what do you call those? Uh, there was just cloth over the, uh, like a washcloth over the, um, over the food, so nothing would touch it. Maybe keep the heat. But he had he had done everything. He had washed the dishes, everything like that, and had the supper ready. And he had already left by the time we came back. So my grandma's generosity was returned with his generosity by by cooking for us. So I thought that was. Uh, I thought that was really neat, and that's, that's something you don't see too often in our people anymore. And you know, it's a, I think it's something that's greatly missed by by our people. I remember when my grandma passed away, that old man came, and he talked about that time as well, and how how great that felt to have somebody look look after him that way. So that's something I just absolutely. Uh, I absolutely miss that kinds of stuff, you know, where somebody just comes by to come and visit you again and just visit not to not to uh come here and talk harshly about somebody or come and ask you for something. They're just coming there to visit visit you about whatever it was, right? Like I remember that growing up as a kid. A lot of people used to stop by my grandparents' place and just come and visit. It was a uh, it was really nice. Sometimes they'd only say a few words and sit in the living room, drink tea, smoke cigarettes, and not, not even say anything. They would just sit there and, and enjoy each other's company, I guess. I don't know what it was. And my grandma would be sitting in the, in the um, kitchen making birch bark canoes and teepees, and I'd be over there squishing, squishing the, um, the sweet grass to get all the water out so that she can, you know, start wrapping them around her her things, you know, then after that we would go get water or bring wood or, or something like that, right, so those are kinds of things that we used to do when we were kids. My brother Nathan and I were, we just recently started talking about this, my brother Nathan and I, when we were kids in nursery school, when we went to school, I'm 40 years old now, and when we went to kid our nursery school when we were kids, we still spoke our language in 
I believe it was Manyan, Rosemary Trillo, that were our teachers because we spoke in the Anishinaabe. So it was, it was hard for us when we were growing up, even at that age. Even when we got to kindergarten, we were still speaking Anishinaabe, and we kind of lucked out because Noreen Mantawabi was our teacher. And then after that, we, uh, I, I went to grade one, and uh, Miss McLeod was my teacher. But Miss McLeod passed away. So Miss McLeod used to teach me in our language plus in English because she'd always tell me, you have to learn it this way because that's just the way things are becoming now. And I was like, well, okay. So she would say Bejik to me, you know, and which is one. So she then she would teach me how to say one and then niche, you know, so on and so forth with a whole bunch of different things. But like I said, Miss McLeod passed away and we got a new teacher and her name was Sheila Lumley. And she was, you know, she was white and it became really hard for me to be in school because, well, because I didn't really speak English. It was really hard. Most of the uh, most of the class spoke spoke our language, so we'd be out on the playground speaking our language. Then we'd have to come inside and just be frustrated because we couldn't really speak English all that well, right? So that was the beginning of my uh, my uh, education, I guess. And as years went on, you know, you you start learning English and so on and so forth, and you know, all that's. All that stuff's gone now. The majority of my friends, they can speak some Nishnabe Mwen, but can understand it well, but can't speak it any that, all that well anymore. Because when you speak our language, it, it, it involves your tongue to move a different way, right? So when you speak English, it involves your tongue to move a different way as well. So learning how to do that all over again is, is quite hard. And I guess, I guess that's where they call that, where people have that Indian accent, you know? <laughs> when you speak English, you sound like you have this really strange accent, right? <clears throat> but yes, that's, uh, that's some of the stuff that, uh, that people go through, like nowadays, right? Language is a, language is a huge thing. Mods win temegache, like what that means is mods win is like a, your life, like it, there's a life with inside your language. So, our language is totally, totally descriptive, right? So it's uh, it's much more when you say it in our language. Even the jokes that people tell or the funny stories you hear, they're much funnier in our language. Eh? But you switch them to English, it's just really just it's kind of bland. Eh? But when you hear it in Nishnabe, oh my God, it's. Uh, it's so hilarious, and then the way the story is told, it's almost like, it's almost like you're right there, that yeah, the person telling the story, story might point, and you're, you're looking over there, thinking, you know, oh my God, you know, it's almost like you're there. So, <clears throat> when, when people are growing, nowadays, sure, education is the key to everything and all that sorts of stuff, but if you don't have the education of your own people, then, you know, you really don't have too much of anything. You just have the education of everybody else, right? You're, you're just, in that sense, you just have the same education as everybody else. You're no different from them in that, in that sense. But when you have the education of your own people, that's, that's a huge thing, you know, when you know you're, when you can speak and understand your language that's a huge thing to have that because your mind is different even right our language teaches us to respect the earth and to understand the earth and and all the things that are here on earth right so there's so many cool cool things to to uh to see just even in your language i heard an old guy one time an, an elder say one time he said Imagine if you learned one word a day for for the calendar days, which is 365, he says. That's 365 words. So it would take you one year to be pretty darn fluent. 
in your language, he said. Which made total sense, right? So <clears throat> that's what I that's what I do for myself sometimes when people come here. When they come to visit Phyllis Williams, Doreen Shredo, Dorothy Fox, and, you know, and, uh, Muriel Sinaway. When these ladies come by to come and visit or we're getting ready to do justice circles and one of them speaks English, I, I always go, hey, you can't, you can't speak like that in here. And they just smile. Oh, Ganjida, they'll say, hey, I'm sorry. Whoops. You know, so they'll just, they'll just speak Nishnabim when, when they're here until our client shows up or, or whatever is going on that day. So, you know, educating yourself and, 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 and being who you are is a, is a real, is a real, is a, is something that you should be proud of. Your identity is, is a huge thing. You can always, that should come first and foremost before any PhD or KFC or just kidding or anything like that <laughs> you know it, it should be you you know you should be able to say me mumpy this is where I come from this is who I come from I come from people that were hard working people people that made gardens because that's what they had to do people that used to have to haul their water from the bay or from a well and so on and so forth that's where I come from that's who I am that's that's the life I I had before I was here now. That's who I that's where I come from. And and for our people to celebrate our our people, our elders. These people are people that came from just a you know a beautiful life if you look at it that way, where it was simple. You were hard working, you you did things to sustain your life every day. You hunted, you fished, you chopped wood, you planted potatoes and so on and so forth. That was your life basically. But all these things are now called teachings. If somebody makes a garden, well we'll teach you how to make the you know when years ago that was something you were born into, right? That's how that's how you come to be. Right? So that's that's something I'm really proud of. I'm I'm very proud of where I come from, and and where my people have come from, and and the things they do. I'm proud of where my family on both sides has come from. So, um, in in my lifetime, I wanted to be a nurse, but it never really played out that way. I always wanted to be a nurse. I had no ambition to be a doctor or anything like that. I just wanted to be a nurse just to be able to meet people all the time and all that sorts of stuff, but my life didn't go that way. Uh, you know, things happen where I ended up learning a lot of, like, traditional things like medicine and stuff like that. So I guess in a sense I still am a nurse because I do meet a lot of people and I do give them medicine and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's medicine that my grandmother taught me. And the history of that even was just a... Uh, you know, that was just a no whole, a whole part of a day to, to learn different plants that my grandma would talk to me about, right? And and how you had to talk to those plants, how that plant should look before you pick it, what height that plant should be, and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of, a lot of different things I just that go into just that, right? Aside from having to chop wood and so on and so forth. And so <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of things that we we enjoyed doing. My my brother Nathan and really enjoyed just being a, a farmer. He liked doing that. That was his uh, that was his thing, big trucks and digging up the dirt and all that kind of stuff. That was him. My brother had no time to be listening to this is how the tall this plant should be and so on and so forth. But uh so <laughs> you know if you're going to, if you're going to um, get yourself in, involved in, in stuff like this, you know, when it can not the tone man the madzuin ishin you really need to understand this life. If you're going to do something like that, you understand that for what it is. You're a human being. You make mistakes. Because you hold knowledge, you're no better than anybody else in the world. Nobody. 
if people put them put you on a pedestal, it's those people that do that. Don't you ever do that for yourself or you put yourself up there. Because you got to remember you're just as much as a human being as everybody else is. And that's what that means to... When it comes to Tumandan Madzu, and that's what that means is to really understand uh, your life, right? And where you come from. So, passing something on for me is like uh, when I was a kid, it took my grandma a long time to find somebody to pass the medicine on to, right? Like the medicine I know. And I have a lot of nephews, I have two nieces. So, in. In making medicine and stuff like that, there's, in this time, in this day and age, people are very wary of different things and stuff like that. And I always tell my nieces and nephews, eh, because sometimes they'll say, Shisha, there's something wrong with me, you know. Or, you know, at one time my nephew broke his arm. And um, I said, come on, let's go in the bush, we'll take a walk, I said to him. And then he goes, how come I have to come with you, Shisha? And I said, well, you know what? I said, at some point in life, I'm beginning, going to become a really old man and I might not be able to come out in the bush here and all that kinds of stuff. So if I show you this, then, you, then you'll then always have it. You'll always be able to say, hey, I know what you can use for that and I know where it is and I know what it looks like and so on and so forth. And he goes, oh, okay. So we walked into the bush and he had, he had a broken arm, right? And so I took him to to look at this this tree it's a plant and we call it the rubber tree my family calls it that eh? it's like a really bendy tree you can bend it every which way and it just doesn't break right but what's really interesting about that tree itself is that the when you cut it the uh, bark slides on and off of it so it has um, it's like it's like being able to like break your or I don't know like <laughs> make an incision around your elbow and around your wrist and slide the skin off and fix the bone kind of thing that's the way I had to explain it to him at that time but the inside piece of that tree was like the bone marrow or the bone itself so I told him we're gonna chop it up so that you can drink it and it'll heal your bone faster and it won't make your arm shorter than the other one your your arm will just grow the way it was naturally supposed to grow, so that it's not shorter because you broke it. I says, oh, okay. But I told him, I said, listen, this is what it looks like. And, and then I told him, but before you pick this, pick this stuff, this is what you need to do. So I told him what we had to talk about and talk to the tree about and things like that before we picked it. I told him to tell the story of how he broke his arm. I told him, now you need to ask this tree to help you because you want to fix it and you know and and that you know you have to take its life in order for it to help you so that was the conversation he had with that tree by himself and he put tobacco he put sam out there and then he goes hey uncle just wait you know so he jumps up and he takes off running to the house and he comes back and he has a little car that he absolutely loved one of his Hot Wheels cars. And he says, can I give this to the tree? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. So in exchange for the medicine that that tree had, he exchanged it with the tobacco in that little car he had. And you know, his, his bone healed quite quickly after that. It healed really fast. You know, and he was just amazed by that. And he goes, oh my God, I get to play hockey again, Uncle. I can play hockey now. You know, because it was summertime, but they were still playing road hockey and stuff, right? So he was able to do more stuff. And they gave him a long period of time where it was going to heal, but it healed way faster than that, right? So, and I ask him, and sometimes he'll talk to me about that. Hey, Jish, I remember that time we went over there and stuff like that, so... Those are things I do with my nephews and anybody really that wants to listen or wants wants to see something or, or whatever, right? Or somebody comes here and asks me questions about, you know, our, our culture or some of our traditional things that we do. 
I try to show them like hands on so that they they have it forever. I'm not stingy with that, right? Even the the songs that we sing, the ceremony songs we sing, or somebody comes and asks me like, "How do you remember you composed the song um teen years ago? What are the words to that song?" And I'll I'll tell them, "Oh, you know what? This is how I got that song, you know. I made a song when I was 12 years old. I was in my mom's basement." And it talks about the Nishnah B'madzuin, right? That's what that song is. And um, people ask me for that song sometimes. And they ask me, can I sing it in a sweat lodge and stuff like that? And I go, sure, if you want to. And then they said, what did you make it for? And I said, I just, I made the song because I thought it was a, a good way of uh, talking to people, dancers, maybe the people in the crowd about our life, eh? Nishnah B'madzuin. So that's, why or that's how that that's how that song was born so a lot of people use that song in a sweat lodge when i guess maybe it was just a powwow song or whatever but i mean it was a song to try to teach you about life and stuff right so that's how i try to pass on any bit of knowledge i have to somebody is to just show them show them how it's done whether it's smoking pipe or you know, offering tobacco and cloth to other elders for prayers and things like that. Or uh, <clears throat> one of my nieces asked me one time, Jishan, do you know how to can something? And I said, yeah, I know how to can something. And only because, you know, we spent a lot of time with my grandma, we knew how to can stuff, right? And then she says, Jishan, do you know how to quilt? And I said, yeah, Jishan knows how to quilt. I know how to sew, I know how to knit, I know how to crochet, I know how, you know, because I spent so much time with my grandma. We knew, we know how to do that stuff, right? My, my, uh, my niece says to me, Jisha, I don't think you're an uncle, I think you're an auntie, he says. <laughs> or she says to me, and start laughing. But, you know, my, um, my nieces learned how to sew from me. You know, I taught them how to sew and... Because that's something we picked up, right, when we were kids. That was a part of life, too. If you were, uh, you know, if I was a single man and I needed something sewn, well, I could sew it myself. You know, because I paid attention to those kinds of things. In this day and age, you have to really, you have to really do something that's going to keep the attention of the youth nowadays. Because, you know, there's cell phones and PS4s and Xboxes and so on and so forth, right? So that's how... That's how things are right now. So when we when we teach something, we make sure it's really hands-on. When we go out in the bush or something like that, we always tell each other, even me, that my nephews and my nieces tell me, leave your cell phone in the truck, Shisha. Okay, so we leave it all in there and we just go out in the bush and stuff. You know, snaring and stuff. All my nephews know how to hunt. All of them do. Even my nieces do, you know. So everything I've ever taught Somebody, since I was young till now, has always been hands-on, and that because that's the way I learned how to do stuff as well. Uh, there's things that you just cannot learn from books or watching a YouTube video or anything like that. There's uh, if you learn stuff like that, that's fine, that's great, but you're missing the connection there. And once once you learn that connection, and then it's just it's it's your way, right? But that your way has always been born from what was behind you, right? And who's taught you and, and where that's come from, right? So my grandma's hands and the things that my grandma's hands did in her lifetime, my nieces and my nephew's hands can do those same things. And I always remind them of that, eh? To always take the time to, to understand that, that that's how you know how to do that now because... Uh, Okmis and Mishumis taught us how to do those things all those all those years ago. So now you can do them here in in this time, right? If the power goes out, you know, this is what you can do. That's how you can live. Even when we go through the bush, they always ask me, can you eat that? No, you can't eat that, but you can eat this and so on and so forth. Again, so there's a lot of things that my nephews and nieces and people that are with me that just understand about about the bush you know and and things like that and i have no problem teaching anybody that wants to learn that kinds of stuff and and understand it but i will say this though 
is that <clears throat> when it comes to teaching something to somebody, my people come first. Our people. Nishnabek, right? Nishnabek or, or Sioux people, Mohawks or, or Inus or wh whatever it may be, as long as it's our people, they will come first. That's just how I see that because if you want to talk about tradition, that's how the tradition in my family was, was to teach your people first. That belongs to your people, right? If somebody else wants to learn that, that's fine. But the here is who comes first, right? So <clears throat> that's that's one thing I've I've always been really solid about. So no offense to the rest of the world, but that's just how how it is for me. Uh, hunting too, like hunting, same thing. In in our in our background, in my background as a hunter. My grandparents uh, taught us to hunt to eat, not hunt for sport or to be able to say, ah, look what I got, you know. You hunted to eat, and that's all it was. There was no hokiness to it. There was nothing like that to it. It was always about you hunt to eat, and that's it. It does, it does not matter how you go and get that animal. If your family is hungry, you feed that your family. That's your job. That's your life. That's what you need to do. That's what the man does. Eh? So, <clears throat> you know, there are things that in a rites of passage, when, when I learned how to hunt the first time with the 22, my grandpa let me have the 22 one day for the first time. It was amazing. I hunted with a BB gun that I had paid for by winning at bingo that I went played bingo with my grandma. I won 95 bucks. I went to Mastin's in Mantuaning and I bought a BB gun. First gun ever. Oh my God, I was just, you know, I was just so excited about this. And, and one of my grandma's thoughts were, he's going to shoot the windows out of something. And I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, I'm going to shoot something to eat it. So I remember I shot, you know, lots of partridge, lots of rabbits. I hunted all, because I had a BB gun in my hand, I thought it was a great, you know, it was whatever, right? And, and that's what I did. And then one day my grandpa says, he says to me, no shit, Smujan, like, come, come here, my grand, grandson, he says. So I went in the thing, and he's sitting there with the twenty two in his hands, eh? And I, and I went out, and, and, and I go, well, you know, what's going on, Grandpa? Ambe, he says, let's go outside. And I said, okay. So we went outside. And my Grandpa took a bullet and put it in the twenty-two, and pulled the hammer back. And I remember looking at him going, well, like, what's he shooting? I was thinking, I was really looking around. Eh? And he, he gives me that gun, and it's loaded. And I was, <gasps> you know, and I put my hands on this gun. And my grandpa says, you see the dirt there? He says, take a shot. Okay, I said, so I took took the gun and poof, shot that twenty two for the first time. And I watched the dirt just lift poof, like that. He says, you see the power that has? And he says, yeah. I said, yeah to him. He says, your BB gun doesn't have that power, right? And I said, no, it doesn't. He goes, from today, he says, I don't ever want you to point that at another person, even if it's not loaded. You've seen the power that this gun has. Understand that power, he said to me. Okay, okay, Grandpa. And he goes, Mia, he says to me, eh? like, that's it? And I was like, really? And I looked at him again. Grandpa, do I get to hunt with this? And he goes, yep. I was like, oh my God. So I was... I was ecstatic, man. I was so friggin' happy. I hired this lady from here in Wiki because nobody else would drive me. My grandpa had to be here. My grandma had to be there that morning. My mom had to go there. My dad was out in North Bay at school, right? And what wasn't going to be back till that more that following morning, right? So I hired a lady in Wiki. She uh, came up to my mom's and I was looking at her and I go, "Hey, I have thirty bucks. Can you drive me to the borderline in the morning?" And my mom's looking at me and going, what do you mean? Nibagi says so. I want to go hunting, mom. Oh, oh, oh. So that lady looks at me and then looks at my mom, eh? 
And then my mom goes, you know, like, he just gestures to her. And the lady goes, sure. Where should be? And I said, can you be here at 5.30, 6 o'clock? You'll be up? And I said, yeah, I'll be up. So she says, nah. -ha. So she had this big, big old boat of a car. It just had this huge trunk in it. So she dropped me off at the borderline. I got the gun, you know, I got all set and I walked up the hill. And it's, you know, there's fresh fallen snow on the ground. Eh? And this lady says, I'll just sleep here till you get back. And I said, oh, okay, cool. So I walked up the hill and I was walking. I was so excited. And, you know, even if I didn't see a deer, I was just, you know, I was just so happy. I must have had the biggest smile in the world that morning. And then, <laughs> and then I got up to the hill and then the bush started getting darker. And I was just like, and I was, I, I had never really been there before. I was just following the trail. I remember how dark the bush was, and I was just thinking, <gasps> and then I got scared for a second, and then I thought, what the hell am I scared of? I got a gun in my hands, you know, so, so what the hell with that? So then I took a few more steps, and then I heard this noise. <coughs> what is that? I thought, so I stopped, eh? and it's listening. And so I looked to where the noise was, and I couldn't see, it. and as the, the more light came from the morning, there's a deer looking at me, chewing on an apple and I was like yes yes so I put the I put the bullet in the in the in the, in the gun and I loaded it I cocked the hammer and I put the gun up and I couldn't see the iron sights so I pointed in the sky and I could see the iron sights and I remembered where they did it and I did it again and I shot and this big deer just dropped on the ground oh my god I was so excited but after I shot, I was going to scream, and then I heard it again. I was like, what the hell? So I took the bullet out, and I loaded another bullet, and I looked. And there's another deer looking right at me after I shot this one. So I took the 22 and shot it again, and it dropped. I was like, oh, my God. I just shot two deer. So I was so happy. I pulled this rope out of my bag and, you know, put the harness on my body. And I tied these two deer up by the neck because I didn't know how to skin a deer, right? I, I had, I'd seen my grandpa do it so many times, but I didn't want to mess it up. You know, I just didn't want to. I wanted my grandpa to show me. So, you know, I harnessed these deer up and it was easy to pull them in because of snow. So anyways, I was going down the hill and the sun's coming up and I'm noticing hey, that the snow's melting. So, <laughs> So anyways, we, I get down the hill and I bang on the window and that lady's, ah, she got scared because she was sleeping. And I go, Gidebna, Nish, Ne Nisha, or Nish, Washkeshak, Gidebna. Nish, she says, and I said, eh, Nish, Kwe Washkeshak, like two does, eh? So, ah, uh, she says. So she helps me put these deer in her trunk and we drive these deer to my grandparents' place. And uh, she drives them all, my grandpa says, drive them all the way down to the end of the field. So we drove down there, and we got down there, and my grandpa brings down the uh, quad, I think it was at the time. So my grandpa says, uh, you know, you got to clean those out. And I go, yeah. And, he, and then he's looking at me, well, get to it. So I'm looking at him going, what do I do first? And he goes, you know how to do that. You've seen me do it. And I said, okay. I just needed to hear my grandpa, so I cut the deer up and gutted it out. And then my grandpa says, Becca. And here's where a life lesson came. He says, Becca, Manda Kishichige. So he cut the heart out. And he pulled it out and he cut a sliver of that heart out. And he goes, Mijin Manda. And I was just like, ugh. And then I was just like, oh, I don't eat that, Grandpa. It's not cooked. My Grandpa says, eat it. So I ate it. And he goes, there. Now you always be a part. Like, you always have a connection with these washkeshuk, he said, eh? I said, okay. And he goes, don't wait. You're not done yet. Take the hearts and the liver and go. There's a big rock over there. He goes, go and put them there. But this is what you tell tell them. Your grandpa before me, your great-great-grandpa, your great-grandma, your great-aunties, all of them. You tell all of them, Ruisnik, come and eat. Here's uh, This is my first time I killed something. I've become a man today. This is what you tell them. And you... You feed them. You feed all of them. Tell them to come and eat the liver and the heart. Come, come and eat it with you. So that's what I did. 
And while I was doing that, my grandpa, <laughs> my grandpa fires up the, oh, it was a tractor, sorry. My grandpa fires up the tractor and he takes off on me. I was like, what the heck? I thought we were going to bring the deer over there and hang them up or whatever, right? So I'm looking at him real long. Half an hour goes by. And I said, ah, oh, to hell with this. And I just dragged these over there. So I started dragging them back up the hill because I thought in my mind, I'm not waiting for them to come back. So I dragged them back up the hill. By this time, it's, it's warm outside. The snow is melted, so it's, they're heavier, right? Anyways, I get there, and my grandpa goes, Bah, me so, he says to me, hey, that's awesome. He goes, now you have a real respect for that animal. You, you, you've seen the work it takes to get this animal back home here, hang him up and skin him and everything. Now you know that. That's why he didn't help you take that. That's your job to do that. Okay. So, all right, so we get to eat him, Grandpa, and my Grandpa goes, no, you don't. What? I said, and he says, yeah, you have to clean him up now, cut it all up, everything like that, package it up. Midash, uh, he says, Kaminak, the Madzajik, you'll feed the people now, you go give all that deer meat away. What? I said, I was so, I was like in disbelief, eh? But my Grandpa said, that's what you do, that's the first time you killed something. You share it with the people, he said. Okay, I said. So I cut up this deer all day, two deer. I cut them all up. My grandpa showed me how to make nice cuts and all this stuff. And then we got on the, my mom's van. My mom drove me down to Wiki, stopped at my Auntie Victoria's. I gave her some meat, went all the way down to uh, Flamon's, and I dropped some meat off there. Went up to Reckley's, gave them some meat. Went up to Babomkwe's, gave them some meat. Went across the bay to Churros, gave them some meat, you know, and then we got home and then and then somebody, oh, we went to Rosie and uh, Big Joe Shkabasis, but their place, and I gave them the rest of what I had left. And Rosie, Rosie came out of the, uh, came out of the bedroom, and she was holding a, um, what do you call that, thing? Uh, a gun case. Manda came in and she says, that's your first deer, here's your gun case. I was like, oh, wow. So she gave me a gun case for that 22, and Big Joe gave me a strap for that gun. He gives, here, here, here it is. So all these places I went to, all these people gave me something in exchange for that deer meat. So I guess in, 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 when people talk about bundles and stuff like that, that's where my bundle started. The knife I had used that day to clean those deer, my grandpa had given me that knife. Uh, you know, the rope I had had there, my grandma gave me that rope, you know, uh, the clothes I had on, the socks, my grandma gave me those things. So those things were a part of my bundle, the beginning of my bundle, right? So, so that's, where, that's where I learned to be a man. That's where I became a man. That was my rites of passage. That made me, that made me a man, or, or what they would call ogichita, right? Ogichita doesn't just... It means a warrior, but that warrior's job is to take care of the people. And that's the thing I learned that day, right? It was to be one of those individuals. And that's what my grandma and grandpa gave me that time. So when I got home, I was I was kind of sad almost. Eh? My grandma just looks at me. Oh, Shindy, and she says, Gwisa, she used to call me. Eh? Don't be like that, she says to me. I said, grandma. And she goes, do you know what you just did today, she said? She goes, all those people you gave all that dear me to, all those people, not any of those people don't have hunters in their family. We know them. That's why we told you, go to those people, because nobody hunts for their families anymore. If they get deer meat, it's because somebody gives it to them. Nobody hunts there no more. That's a beautiful thing you did that and that really made me smile so over the years up till this time in my life for every year I've ever hunted those same families I drop meat off to every year or those same families come and see me every year for deer meat you know so I have no problem sharing things like that so that that was one of my biggest life lessons was that that you always share with somebody what you have right whether it's medicine whether it's food, whether it's knowledge of something, you share that with people. 
You don't need to make it a teaching or a life's lesson. It's just, it's just sharing sometimes, you know, that will last a lifetime. So that's, that's what to me, Manda, that's what that means to me, that Manda Madzuin, eh? Like Nishnaba Madzuin, that's our life, eh? So.